first presentation is entitled Improving CMA Using Correlation Optimization. The work is by Peter Robbins, Peter Quax, Wim Lamott, and the presentation will be given by Peter. Right, thank you for the introduction. It's an honor to be here, and in this presentation I'll talk about how to improve CMA attacks using a technique that we developed which is called correlation optimization. So first of all, I wanted to start with an introduction about what electromagnetic uh, side channel attacks are. And I know a lot of you are already familiar with it, so I apologize uh, for those of you who already know a lot about EM side channel attacks. But for the newbies around here, uh, so EM side channel attacks are possible when you have a certain leakage from a device that differs between key dependent operations. And this presentation will talk about SEMA attacks on AES in particular. So well, what happens in the SEMA attack is you have a Pearson correlation, which we use as a metric to compare the leakage versus a certain hypothesis key that the attacker will uh, compose. So schematically, what happens is the attacker will, will first send the plain text to encrypt to the device. The device will perform the encryption and then inadvertently leak some electromagnetic radiation during the computations. And then finally, the attacker can simulate the leakage for each possible value of a section of the key, for example, a single byte and then try to correlate these with the actual measurements. And then the key byte with the highest correlation is then our best guess, and that's what we will uh, select for uh, our attack. Now, uh, more formally, what we have is, for example, a vulnerable point in the AS algorithm, which is typically chosen as the S box of the plain text XORT with the key, uh, which happens in uh, the first round of AS. And then the attacker, what the attacker can do is just compose a model for each possible value of the key byte, J. So we'll essentially create uh, 256 models, uh, each with their own respective leakage values for each possible uh, trace and M. And so uh, if you note that we are using the Hamming weights leakage model here, uh, we could use another leakage model such as Hamming distance as well. Uh, Hamming weight is actually more a simplified version where you assume that the previous uh, registers are zero, but uh, any uh, leakage model can be used here. So what we'll end up with is a kind of a matrix with um, models for uh, what the power consumption would look like or the EM consumption or EM leakage would look like. And then we can try to take a correlation with the actual measurements XT of our um, traces. Now the motivation for this work is that if we look at recent advances in machine learning and deep learning, and in particular if we look at the uh, review paper that was uh, published a few years ago by Jan LeCun, one of the principal authors of uh, the machine learning domain, then we can see that machine learning and, and deep learning algorithms consistently outperform uh, classical methods in uh, the area of pattern recognition. So if you look at, for example, uh, face recognition or handwriting recognition, uh, then we see that machine learning and deep learning uh, models typically perform much better. So and if you consider side channel analysis as a kind of uh, leakage, uh, kind of pattern recognition problem, then the question is, can we apply this to side channel analysis as well? and uh, achieve a very good uh, performance with these deep learning and machine learning models. And already there are some promising results in recent related work, so feel free to check uh, those references out if you want to. They are at the bottom of the slide here. And this is an example of what a trace would look like uh, for AES, for example. In this case, AES 128. So what happens in previous works mostly is that you have a certain model that's being trained, and usually it's a deep convolutional neural network. So what does that mean? You have a stack of, of layers, of convolu convolution layers and pooling layers, and they will essentially, uh, if you train this model, it will learn some kind of filter that will, be, uh, that will slide over your inputs. Then you do some pooling on those uh, outputs, and that goes on to the next layer until you reach a certain output. And in this case, the output is a probability distribution for the intermediate value of the key by taking on a certain value. So uh, considering that we have 256 possible values, you have 256 possible probabilities, and so we're going to try to optimize the average cross entropy loss between the true probability distribution and the predicted probability distribution that is the output of the neural network. And so uh, typically, we're going to attack one key byte at the same time, because then we have uh, 256 classes. If we would take more, then you would need, of course, uh, more classes. And alternatively, what we can also do is try to predict the Hamming weight instead. So in, in, this, in this case, we have only uh, nine classes. And then to attack the entire key instead of one byte, what you can do is you can train multiple convolutional neural networks to attack, for example, the first byte, the second byte, and so on. Or you can uh, multiply the number of outputs by 16, for example, to uh, give a prediction for all keys simultaneously, for example. Those are all possibilities. 
Now, what we're going to do in our, in our what we did in our work is something slightly different. It's more inspired by the recent works in face recognition where the idea is not to classify and, and, and uh, output a certain probability, but rather learn a representation or encoding of the inputs. And in this case, our inputs are the EN traces. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn an encoding of the traces that is correlated with the true leakage value um, that uh, is, is output by the device. So we can do this by optimizing the correlation loss function, which is known in the machine learning community as a cosine proximity function as well. And so the advantage of using this methodology is that we only have one value per key byte as output. So that's uh, number of outputs reduced by factor nine for Hamming rate learning and by factor 256 if we are going to try to classify a single byte. So this means it's also trivial to learn a model for the entire key instead of just for one byte of the key. However, a disadvantage is that we need to perform a standard SEMA attack on the outputs uh, of the neural network, so on the on encodings instead of the uh, actual traces. But this is also very fast because we only need 16 points uh, for a 16 byte key. And then the second contribution is that we uh, devise a methodology to remove the alignment requirements. So, because as you know, if you wanna take, if you wanna perform a SEMA attack on a set of traces, you wanna make sure that every trace is aligned at the same point, because otherwise you'd be taking correlations at different uh, samples, which is not what you want, of course. So, uh, as a concrete example of what this looks like, suppose that we have five traces, five measurements, and so we wanna predict um, for one byte of the key what the leakage would look like. So suppose that the true Hamming rate values of the intermediate value, which is S box of PS, uh, X or KS, are five, six, seven, five, and one. What we then do is we feed the input traces to the neural network. Uh, we will try to optimize the correlation with those true values. And as output, we can get something like this. So this is an actual uh, training that I did on neural network. And as you can see, these values are uh, very strongly correlated with the true um, uh, Hamming rate values. In fact, they have a correlation of uh, very close to one. And even if we multiply this by 100, for example, because it's the Pearson correlation, it's independent of scale, so we still have a, a large correlation with the actual Hamming rate values. And so what we do in essence is we discard the useless points from our input traces and end up with only one point, which represents all the information we need to perform uh, an effective SEMA attack on uh, the output. So then about removing the trace alignment uh, requirements, well, the problem with these kind of networks is they are um, pretty simple, and if you, for example, would translate the trace with one sample to the, to the right, so if, if x1 becomes x2 and so on, then you would see that the, the wrong, I mean, the, the, the learned weights will not correspond to the right features anymore, right? So that's why MLPs are very sensitive to feature translations. And as a solution to that, what we decided to do is use the magnitude and, or power spectrum of the Fourier transform, uh, and use that as features for the uh, neural network. And a similar idea has been applied in DMAC context by TU et al. in 2005. And so we're, we're borrowing from that idea and applying it in a machine learning context in our work. Now, why does this work? Um, so here's a, a little demo that I made. Uh, suppose that we have a signal composed of two leaking signals. One is at four hertz and the other is at 30 hertz. And here you can see them uh, both added with each other. Uh, I also added some random uh, uniform noise, so that's why you have some noise in the FFT here below. And what happens if we phase shift the signal? Then you can see that those two leaking frequencies are still visible in uh, the Fourier transformation. So if we use this as an input to the neural network instead of the time domain signal, we are suddenly more resistant to translations. All right, so on to the more interesting stuff, the actual results. We had two experiments. In the first experiment, we compared to a SCA net based model on the ASCAT dataset. This dataset uh, features a protected software AS implementation, so it's protected against first order uh, side channel attacks. And the second experiment, we did on our own dataset, which is just a very noisy, uh, unaligned measurement of unprotected AES. And the goal of this dataset is more to show resilience against uh, feature translations and uh, noisy datasets. We also released this data set to the public domain, so if you wanna do your own experiments uh, with that data, feel free to do so. And what we show is that even with a very simple architecture, such as a two-layer MLP, we are able to outperform previously, previously introduced uh, deep learning models, such as the eight-layer CNN. 
Now, the data set was introduced by a very cool work by uh, Emmanuel Proof et al. in uh, reference number two. As I said before, it's an AES protected against first order side channel attacks, and it consists of 50,000 training traces, 10,000 test traces of each 700 samples, and those samples are all uh, located in the first round of AES. Uh, it also features three variants. One is the normal ASCAT dataset. It consists of time-aligned traces. Uh, so first they had a pre-processing step where all the traces were aligned nicely. Then there is a desync variant where the traces are desynchronized with a maximum jitter of 50 samples. And then we have a desynchronized 100 version where the traces are desynchronized with a maximum of 100 samples. All right, so what does it look like if we uh, run our model on those uh, data sets? As a baseline test, I did a regular SEMA attack, and as expected, even after using the maximum number of traces, which is 60,000, you can see that it's still not able to find the correct key. So rank indicates how many guesses we have to do before uh, getting the right key. And so it doesn't really, uh, the, the attack doesn't really succeed. Now, if we train a one-layer MLP using correlation optimization, um, which we saw in the previous slides, then, and note that the X axis has changed here, so it's only 5,000 instead of 60,000, then we can see that for the ASCAP data sets, which, is, which features the aligned traces, the rank appears to drop and almost uh, hits zero at around 5,000 traces. For the two-layer two MLP, which is able to capture more uh, complex features of the traces, we can see that after 1,000 traces, it already uh, hits a rank of zero. But as expected, since the MLP is very sensitive to feature translations, what you can see is that for the desynchronized data sets, which are desync 50, which is the orange graph, and desync 100, which is the green one, uh, that it's still not able to find uh, the correct key, as expected. So we apply our methodology to uh, remove the alignment requirements, so we transform everything to the frequency domain, and already there is some interesting result here because for, even for our baseline test, the regular SEMA, it seems that after about 60,000 traces, it, all the data sets appear to go to zero already. If we then uh, do the same for our one layer MLP, again, we can see that it's, uh, now it has actually found the correct key after 5,000 traces. Um, not so much for the desynchronized uh, data sets, but if we add another layer and uh, hence allow to learn more complex features, then you can see that for all three data sets, it's able to find uh, the correct key in about 1,000 traces. How does this compare to previous work? Well, this was the best CNN model from uh, the original authors of the ASCAT paper, and so it appears to do a little bit better, especially for the uh, desync 50 and desync 100 data sets, which uh, the original uh, deep CNN could not find, and that's because of our uh, FFT-based approach. Then for the second experiment, uh, recall that uh, we just wanted to see how well our model could um, deal with very noisy and unaligned signals. So what we did is make a training set of 51,000 random key encryptions, a validation set of 32,000 fixed key encryptions, and then uh, capture those with a relatively low sample rate of 8 million samples per second, and then without any pre-processing or alignment. So we just feed the raw data to the neural network and let it uh, do its thing. And then after 22,000 traces, we were able to find the correct key for this uh, data set as well. All right, so on to the conclusions. We've demonstrated the usage of machine learning as a means for feature extraction rather than classification. And those features are extracted by optimizing the correlation loss as opposed to the cross entropy loss from previous works. And on the ASCAT data set, we show that we achieve a better performance despite using only a very shallow MLP architecture, uh, which allows us to train much faster uh, on, a, on a data set. Alignment issues can be resolved by operating in the frequency domain. And if you want to check out the code yourself or look at the data, it's all uh, open source and on GitHub. Uh, there is also a framework that I made for uh, easily processing batches of traces or working with the ASCAT data set. So feel free to check that out if uh, you'd like to do some work on that as well. And then for future work, here's some ideas that I had in mind. Uh, if you look at the computer vision domain, there are a lot of uh, things going on around Siamese networks, where, which is basically just another way of uh, training a neural network. And they achieve very good results, so feel free to check that out. And I think maybe in the side channel domain, we can apply similar principles in order to uh, increase the performance even more. It will also be interesting to apply this kind of techniques to other uh, domains in crypto or other crypto algorithms, for example, on ROSA, for example. 
and then improvements to existing data sets. This is actually funny because uh, I had contact with the authors of the ASCAP data set yesterday and they already fixed this issue. So uh, at the moment, it, uh, previously it used a fixed key, but uh, fortunately variable masking values of course, but now they've also randomized the key to make it a little bit more uh, realistic. And then finally, implement state-of-the-art architectures from the CV domain such as ResNets, which I have not seen that much in uh, current SEA literature yet, but uh, are very interesting if you look at uh, those papers from the CV domain. All right, so that's it on my end. If you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. We have time for questions. See no hands, I start. Um, so if I understand correctly, you uh, propose basically to use machine learning then so not, not for the full attack, but for, for feature extraction. Yeah, exactly. And um, in, in this work, you say, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I find a, an encoding, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And does that basically mean that I'm, I, I'm finding one feature? And if so, why, why not extend this and say, I'm, I'm yeah. going to find like two, three, four features? So if I go back to this slide right here. So indeed, as, as you said, it's indeed one feature. And the advantage is if, for example, if you have, uh, set, let's say you wanna uh, classify faces, for example, and you have one million faces, then you don't need one million outputs. You can just have one scalar value that indicates how, uh, that gives a, a certain similarity, and then you can compare that to a certain database. So what this allows you to do is, in, at first we need a lot less outputs, so instead of 256 outputs, we need only one. And this allows us to train much faster. So that's basically the main benefit from that. Okay, um, but you said also that the, the method now allows to train for an entire key rather than only for bytes. Sorry, can you repeat that? You said that with this method you, could, you can train directly for an entire key and yeah. you don't have to do it yeah, for okay, key bytes. Yeah. yeah, so this was only an example for one byte of the key because there's only one output, but what you can do is you can just, I mean, these are now grayed out, but you can just uh, allow the neural network to train all these outputs and then um, yeah, you can perform the correlation on, for example, first you do a SEMA attack on the first sample, then you do a SEMA attack on the second sample, and then eventually you get all the bytes of the key. So then, then I would have 16 encodings. Yeah, exactly, okay. yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Please stand up to the mic. Just a, just a very short question. Did you, did you investigate the use of auto-encoders auto uh, for the feature extraction? Could you repeat that, please? Uh, did you consider, uh, did you investigate the, the use of auto-encoders uh, oh, for the feature uh, extraction? Yeah, yeah so uh, auto-encoders, wh what they do is they would, uh, after learning that, they would, uh, so this output, they would project it back to the original uh, space, which is, uh, I mean, not something that would be useful in this case, I, I believe. Because you're only interested in, in uh, extracting the features and not projecting it back to the original uh, input space, right? Because that's what autoencoders do, right? Yeah, but autoencoders auto also reduce, reducing the, the, the size yeah. of the representations, yeah, so a little bit like feature extraction do. Yeah, if you use, the, if you use only like the, the encoding part of the autoencoder, then of course you get the same thing as... A, as yeah, this, this is the idea. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea, yeah. But you, you didn't work yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, but that's exactly what this, okay. this mm -hmm. is, yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, have you compared your approach with uh, old ones like template attacks and stochastic attacks? Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, have you compared your approach, at least the uh, experiments, with uh, template attacks oh. and stochastic attacks, ah, like using yeah. a stochastic model? Uh, no, that's something I didn't do. Uh, I just wanted to compare with the previous uh, machine learning based works. So that's not something that, uh, that I did. More questions? No? Let's thank the speaker again.